once again today, uh, the work I'll be talking about it is based on joint work with John T. Rowe. So, so, so the first lecture was based on work with Dr. Like Vescoff, the, the second lecture, uh, with John T. Rowe. And you'll see that there it, are some similarities between the talk I gave yesterday, the model of the talk that I gave yesterday, and the one uh, I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, but there are some important differences, too. Uh, for the most part, in the model of yesterday, we uh, had a homogeneous electorate. You could think of the electorate as a, as a single person, uh, except at the very end where I introduced some heterogeneity. Uh, it was a majority group. Uh, but today, the, the, the critical feature is that uh, there is uh, uh, enormous uh, heterogeneity. There's going to be a continuum of uh, different interests. And by doing this, uh, we're getting at the idea that typically uh, officials must put together a coalition and um, often quite different interests in order to get elected. Uh, and there may not be very much overlap between the different interest groups. Just to give um, uh, an example, uh, I'm afraid that, once again, it's an American example. Uh, the the Republican Party um, likes to describe itself as a big tent party. And, and that's getting at the idea that the various uh, supporters of, the, of Republican programs are uh, really quite heterogeneous. Uh, so, for example, we've got people who's, who basically just care about abortion. Right? They're, they're, they're opposed to it. Uh, and they, they support Republicans. Then there are the people who just don't like government. That they, they, they think government should not be uh, interfering uh, in their uh, private lives uh, or in any other part. Uh, and then there are the people who just want to see uh, business supported. Uh, there are actually other groups as well who support uh, uh, Republicans. There, there's the so-called uh, Christian coalition. Uh, and there may be some overlap uh, between these groups, but often there's not very much. Uh, and actually, the, if, if you looked at support for Democrats in the US, you'd get a similar kind of heterogeneity. It, it, this, uh, we, we would maintain, is um, quite normal in, in politics, that political parties are uh, very often Political officials are very often trying to appeal to a range of different groups. And, and that's what we want to um, that's what we want to study today. Uh, we're going to assume that an official is already in office. Uh, and we'll suppose that to get reelected. She wants to appeal to some coalition of interests to get reelected. Uh, and in effect, to relate this to uh, my discussion yesterday, she must pander to these interests. She's going to pander to them by 
by what's called uh, pork barrel spending. Pork barrel spending is public spending which is directed toward one particular group. So, so this one particular group enjoys the benefits of the pork barrel spending, but the entire population, the entire electorate, has to bear the costs. That, that, that's the hallmark of, of pork barrel spending. And, and, that, and that's uh, going to be an important form of spending today. Uh, let me um, mention uh, the particular questions that we're going to try to address. Uh, first of all, uh, how does it, how does the fact that that uh, officials are accountable, they have to run for re-election, uh, affect the overall level of spending? Because we could uh, imagine that these same officials didn't have to run for re-election, we could compare spending in that case. So that would be the first question. Um, we'll suppose that um, accountable officials have to do some spending to get reelected, but we'll also suppose that there is spending that they would want to do anyway, even if they didn't have to get even if they didn't have to run for re-election. Because uh, after all, why, why do you want to be a public official in the first place unless you want to use your office for public purposes, which involves spending? Uh, so we'll suppose that each official is, has some uh, basic propensity for uh, public spending, which may or may not be known to the, to the public. Uh, and one of the things we want to explore is how awareness of a uh, public official's propensity, whether this uh, official is basically a high spender or a low spender, uh, makes a difference uh, to the uh, to the outcome. Uh, and then we're also interested in the extent to which the transparency of the spending itself uh, affects the level of spending. Uh, what I mean by this will become clearer later, but let me uh, just try to clarify now. Say you're one of the interest groups I'm pandering to. Uh, of course, you will have a, a, some notion of how much I'm spending on you, because you get to enjoy the benefits. But you may not have a very clear idea of how much I'm spending on other interest groups, because the costs that you bear due to my spending on these other interest groups may not actually be paid until a long time after, in particular after the election. So uh, you may be aware of uh, this other spending, or you may not. And, and we want to examine how the transparency or the opaqueness of the spending affects how much spending is actually done. And it turns out uh, it, it can make quite a big difference. So that is, uh, that's the agenda for today. Um, I expect that I will probably get through this uh, reasonably quickly. That, that is un unlike yesterday, where I had far too much to, to cram into the time available. Uh, there should be plenty of time left over at the end for questions. And so uh, perhaps it would make sense when we do get to the question period uh, to take questions not only about today's talk, but about the previous two, because 
I imagine you may still have questions about um, those earlier talks. Uh, I should say that, 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 that although the other two talks were based on work which is already published, uh, this talk is still based on work in progress. Uh, that is, we haven't published the paper yet. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, uh, I, I, I prefer giving talks on papers that haven't been finished yet because it, it's quite possible that uh, you will change my mind about something and then there's still a chance to uh, revise the paper. So uh, I'll be especially interested in your questions today. Uh, so that, that's the introduction. Are, are there any questions so far? Uh, I haven't shown you the model or anything yet, but uh, on the general motivation. Okay, so let, let's get to the, uh, to the model. And as I, as I think was announced at the beginning, uh, each of these lectures is getting successively more technical and this, this is a, a more technical one than the, ones, the ones that you've seen already, but uh, you've built up some, some muscles already, so I'm, I'm sure you can handle this one too. Um, so there, there are now going to be uh, two dates. We're not, we're, we're not going to look at constitutional questions today, but the Constitution has already been decided before this model starts. Uh, and in, at date one, uh, an official who is already in office uh, decides on a spending policy. Um, and then at date two, uh, the official, if accountable, uh, stands for re-election. Now most of the time I'm going to be looking at accountable officials, but I'll briefly, uh, as you'll see, compare accountable officials with, with unaccountable ones. The electorate now, as I said, is extremely heterogeneous. It's a, it consists of a continuum of different interest groups, uh, non-overlapping. Uh, and for each interest group, at date one, the official uh, chooses a spending level, uh, which for simplicity we'll suppose is either zero or one. That is, you can spend on the interest group or you could not spend. Uh, if uh, you do spend on interest group I, then that group enjoys a benefit B. Otherwise, it gets a zero benefit. Uh, and then there is a social cost of that spending, which we'll suppose is L. And L is basically shared equally by everybody. Uh, but the part of L which is borne by group I is, of course, tiny. It's infinitesimal. So uh, I will certain, group I will certainly be in favor of the uh, of the spending, since it bears a tiny fraction of the cost. Uh, now, what we'll assume uh, is, at least for now, is that that uh, this spending is uh, is purely pork barrel spending. It, 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 it's uh, it's not socially desirable, and and that's. Uh, reflected in our assumption that uh, L, the overall cost, is bigger than B, the benefits. Uh, I, I will, but I will assume that B is bigger than, um, than L over 2, uh, and you'll see uh, where that assumption plays a role uh, in, a, in a little while. So, uh, so here is uh, 
what the interest group gets as its interest group I gets as its payoff. Uh, it gets yi, which can be 0 or 1, times b, that's the benefit, minus uh, yl, where y is the uh, total spending on all interest groups. Uh, sorry, the, 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 the total uh, number of interest groups that uh, uh, are, uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry, it, 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 it's the total spending on, on interest groups times the, the cost of that spending. And we'll, we'll later be considering two cases. One case is where uh, total spending y is observable to the interest groups, and that we'll call that the uh, transparent case, uh, and the other case is where uh, interest groups cannot observe y, uh, that's the uh, opaque case. <coughs> now, uh, I said that, that officials, politicians, uh, uh, want to do some spending uh, intrinsically, uh, and presumably why they want to do this spending is because they uh, want to uh, do something for the electorate. They may also want to do something for themselves, uh, but uh, in particular, they want to do some, some, something for the electorate. And we'll suppose that uh, for each, uh, for each special interest, for each minority group I, uh, the politician puts a welfare weight of alpha I. On that, on that group. So that th this is the this is the weight that the that the official attaches to to that group. Uh, and just for convenience, I'll uh, I'll assume that bigger values of I correspond to bigger values of alpha. So I I. Uh, I in, I, I've chosen to index interest groups in such a way that uh, higher values of the index correspond to higher weights uh, it, from the politician's point of view. But the important thing is that the politician uh, that, that the weight that the politician attaches to uh, the interest group is private information. Uh, the, the politician knows it, but uh, other people don't. And, and the, the reason why we have this, uh, we assume this asymmetry is uh, to motivate pandering. That is, you. The reason why you pander to group I is because you want to make group I believe that you're on their side. That, that means that they will vote for you in the next election, and that means that they can anticipate that after uh, the uh, election, when you're voted back into office, you will spend on them. If they, if they knew your true alpha I, there'd be no point in pandering. They, 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 could, they could predict in advance what you were going to spend on them. So, so the, this asymmetry of information is important because it motivates pork barrel spending, which wouldn't exist otherwise. Or 
it might exist, but not for, not for the purpose of getting me elected. Uh, and we'll, we'll normalize the alphas so that they, uh, they average out to one. So uh, I described what interest groups get from, uh, from the official spending. What does the official get? Uh, the official, uh, as I said, places a weight alpha i on interest group i. This expression in square brackets is the interest group's payoff from the spending. And we'll suppose that the uh, official simply, it, it, it is simply interested in a weighted sum of the interest group's payoffs. The, the official might get some direct benefits, direct private benefits from the spending too, but those um, would not play a significant role in, in changing any of our results here. So I'm going to leave those out. Uh, this expression can be rewritten like this, so just uh, the same thing rewritten. Uh, and Actually, although a spending policy is, in fact, a, an, in, it's a, it's an infinite, infinite dimensional vector, it's, it's spending for, for each possible interest group, with zero or one for each possible interest group, we can, we can summarize uh, the, we have an adequate su summary for the politician spending simply by, uh, the, by looking at total spending. Because we know, given the way that we have indexed um, the interest groups, that, the, that, the, that whatever spending the politician does is going to be on the index, uh, on the uh, interest groups with higher indices, because he likes those indices. He likes those interest groups more. So, so spending will always take the form of a cutoff rule. Above a certain point, the politician will spend. Below that point, the politician will not spend. And therefore, we can summarize the politician's spending by a single number where the cutoff is. And let's say that the cutoff uh, is alpha star. Uh, then alpha star basically, uh, well, I, let, let me back up. Uh, alpha star is the cutoff that the that the official would choose if she didn't have to worry about re-election. Uh, if she didn't have to worry about re-election, she would simply compare the marginal benefit of additional spending with the, with the marginal cost. With, she, she compared B with L. and. Uh, she, of course, weight the benefit by the welfare weight she gives to the marginal interest group, alpha. So alpha star satisfying this equation would be the cutoff group uh, which, would, um, which would actually receive spending. Uh, and all, all groups with higher indices would also receive spending. Uh, those with lower indices would not. So we can 
summarize uh, a, an unaccountable official's uh, spending uh, by this parameter x, which uh, corresponds to the, uh, to the upper tail of the, of the distribution of outputs. And we can we can summarize the uh, the unaccountable officials pay off by just plugging x into the utility function that I exhibited on, on the previous slide. That this one here. So so we'll we'll, we'll just plug x into <coughs> this utility function to get the unaccountable. Uh, politicians pay off. Uh, I'm going to assume that x is less than a half. Now, why am I assuming that? Uh, if x were greater than a half, then the politician would have a basic propensity for spending uh, money on more than half the electorate. Therefore, even in that case, there's no need for the politician to do any special pandering uh, to get reelected. The politician is going to want to spend on these interest groups anyway. Uh, but if x is less than a half, so x is the, is the natural propensity of the politician. If x is less than a half, then the politician is going to do some additional spending just to get, just to get reelected. Uh, And the accountable politician uh, is going to maximize an expression like this. So u of y is the, is the payoff the politician gets today from doing this spending. But part of the reason why she's doing the spending is because uh, she changes the probability of getting reelected. If she is reelected, she'll enjoy a benefit R tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so P, P of Y is just the probability of being reelected if she adopts this policy Y. Let me, let me start with the case where um, the official's spending propensity x is, is known. So, so people know uh, whether, perhaps from seeing how the politician uh, has behaved in the past, whether she's a big spender or uh, or a stingy spender, they don't they don't know exactly how she want she wants to spend the money, but they can see uh, whether she spends a lot or or a little. Uh, now, in that case, uh, it turns out that whether or not y is observable, total spending is observable, uh, is is unimportant. It doesn't matter whether y is opaque or transparent, because if you know the official spending propensity, you can predict how much she's going to spend in the second period anyway. Uh, so you, so uh, you don't actually have to observe what she's doing in the first period. Uh, and in fact, uh, 
since we're assuming that x is less than a half, it's very easy to predict that y, the, the total amount of spending, is going to be just barely over half of y plus epsilon. Because the, the, the official uh, wants, given, given that she would like to do x, she's going to do only as much additional spending as she has to do to get reelected, and uh, she needs 50% uh, plus to get reelected, so uh, that's what she'll she'll do. She'll she'll appeal to just over half the population. Now. Why will this work? That is, that is why will uh, people who she spends on vote for her? They'll vote for her because uh, if you are in an interest group which has received spending from the politician, your updated probability that this official will spend money on you next period, when she's reelected, is, uh, is x, her, uh, her overall, uh, her basic propensity to, to, to spend, divided by uh, one half. Now, it, it's one half because uh, uh, Given that she's spent on you, and given that there's only an x anti probability of one half that she's going to spend on you in the first period, uh, your chances of being in the favored group in the second period have now doubled. So, so your uh, your updated probability that she will spend on you in the second period is now 2x. It's gone up from x to 2x. Uh, and therefore, if you vote for the politician, you are expected, uh, uh, you're expected to pay off if, if she wins is 2xb. That's the benefit. Uh, you know she's going to spend x next period, so you'll incur a loss of xl. Uh, whereas, uh, if some other official were elected, uh, that some, some other official with exactly the same spending propensity, uh, you would uh, only get XP minus XL because uh, you don't have any particular reason to expect that other official to spend on you. So you, you, will, you will certainly vote for the official if she spends on you, your payoff is higher. And, and so this is, uh, this is the unique equilibrium uh, of this model where uh, interest groups know the officials spend their capacity. And the, the first extremely simple result is that the effect of being accountable is to raise spending. An unaccountable official, a non-accountable official spends only X. That's what uh, the, the fundamental uh, spending propensity is. But a, an accountable official spends more in an effort to get reelected. Okay, now one um, strong assumption I've been uh, making so far is that interest group I, minority group I, uh, votes entirely according to whether she thinks the politician is going to spend on, on that group uh, in the second period. But of course, there are other 
motives than simply that you're going to receive pork barrel spending for voting for a politician. Uh, in particular, and, and we discussed, we, I laid a lot of emphasis on this in the first lecture, there are ideological concerns. Um, so so let, let me uh, enrich the model a little bit. Uh, and suppose that for each interest group I, there's some fraction of, of that group, VI, who vote according to their pocketbook. That is, they, they care only about the official spending. Uh, but there's another group, uh, the remaining group, 1 minus VI, who vote ideologically. Um, I'm not going to... Uh, uh, endogenize the ideological part. I'm going to sort of uh, take the ideological part as a uh, as an exogenous uh, feature of the model or black box. Uh, I'll I'll suppose that uh, uh, for reasons that are not modeled, uh, there's some random fraction of the ideological voters who vote for the incumbent, the, the, the politician who's running for re-election, and the remaining fraction uh, vote for whoever is challenging the incumbent. Uh, but there's nothing the incumbent can do to change that in, in, within the model. But, uh, but uh, the, the point is that uh, this, this fraction phi is not known in advance. It, it's, it's random, and, um, and H is the distribution, the CDF, of, um, of this fraction phi. So that means that in this richer model, uh, the incumbents will be uh, re-elected if this inequality holds. Now, uh, how do we interpret this inequality? Well, uh, the pocketbook, each pocketbook voter will vote for the incumbents if the incumbents has spent money on that interest group. So, so for each interest group i, if yi is 1, a fraction vi, which is the pocket, pocket group contingent of that interest group, uh, will, will vote for, uh, for the incumbent. So the expectation uh, of vi, yi over i uh, is the, the total fraction of pocketbook voters, it, it, sorry, it's the total fraction of voters who vote for the um, incumbents because of her spending. And then, of course, the, uh, there are the ideological voters. Uh, there's a, a fraction one minus v of, of, of those, and of uh, ideological voters, a fraction phi vote for the incumbent. So this expression on the left-hand side is, it, it is the total proportion of voters, the total proportion of voters who vote for the incumbent, given their standard. And then the, the expression on the right is just the, the total it's the remaining fraction. It, it's the total proportion of voters who vote for the challenger. Uh, the incumbent wins if she gets more votes than the challenger. So, so that explains uh, this inequality. Uh, and then uh, we can rearrange this inequality to put phi on the on, on one side of the inequality and everything else on the other, but we know um, how 
uh, phi is distributed, it's, a, it's distributed according to this CDF H. And so the, the probability that this inequality is satisfied is just the probability that phi is, is uh, uh, above some cutoff, uh, uh, above the cutoff that satisfies this inequality. And, that, and that's 1 minus H of, of this value here. So that means that we can write the politician's maximization problem as the problem of uh, maximizing her payoff today plus the probability of being reelected times the payoff from being reelected. Uh, this is the same problem that we looked at on the previous slide, only now uh, there are these ideological voters as well. Um, and in this richer model, uh, the interest, interest group I will, will be spent on if, if this inequality holds. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated before. In the basic model, an interest group was spent on by the, in, by the incumbents provided that the interest group had a high enough index. The, provided that the, that the uh, politician liked the interest group. Uh, and now it's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, this, this inequality has to be satisfied. And, and, and the way to uh, interpret this inequality is through this second proposition. Uh, first of all, any interest group is uh, more likely to be spent on as alpha i increases. That's the same result as before. This inequality is more likely to be satisfied as alpha goes up. That's the same as before. Uh, but um, now it turns out that the, that the second period payoff plays a role too. That the more the the more accountable the public official is, or the the, 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 the more uh, the public official cares about getting reelected, the more spending there is. So this inequality is also be more likely to be satisfied as R goes up. And probably the most interesting uh, part of this result is that public spending also goes up as H prime goes up. So H prime, re remember uh, there, there's this distribution of phi. Phi is the proportion of ideological voters who vote for the uh, incumbents. Uh, sorry, it, it, it's the it's the. Let, let, let me go back and, and uh, yeah. Right. Uh, it, it's the, it's the fraction of, of the ideological voters who vote for the incumbents. So what, uh, what we see is that As H prime increases, which corresponds to what is H prime? It's H prime is the density of phi. H is the is the cumulative uh, is the cumulative distribution function. H prime is the density of phi. It, it's how um, 
how uh, uh, concentrated around one half the, the distribution of phi. The, 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 the closer phi is to one half, it, in some sense, the closer the, uh, the battle is uh, between the incumbents and the challenger. The closer phi is in probabilistic terms to one half, the more important it is, or, or, the, or, or the more effective spending is going to be on the pocketbook vote. So in a, in a close contest, uh, uh, from the ideological point of view, the way that the incumbent gets a, an advantage is to, is to do pork barrel spending on the pocketbook voters. Uh, so the, the, in other words, the incumbent may well want to spend money on interest groups that it doesn't really care about, simply because uh, uh, those are very close contests. And then the, and then the final observation is that, uh, and again this is not uh, uh, a surprise, is that uh, to the extent that ideology becomes more important, uh, uh, sorry, less important, uh, or Put another way, to the extent that pocketbook voters become more important, the uh, the incumbent is inclined to spend more because uh, the more pocketbook voters there are, the, again, the more effective the spending is going to be. Okay, so uh, so that's that's the second result, and and as I said, I think the most interesting. Uh, Part of this proposition is the is the political competition part. Now, in practice, many governments try to rein in uh, public spending by setting at least informal benchmarks. So for example, uh, in the European Union, there are rules which are supposed to be followed. Of course, we've, we've seen that they haven't been followed very well, but they're supposed, that there, there are rules about uh, the magnitude of deficits that, that, uh, that governments are uh, supposed to stay under. In their public spending, uh, and, and this 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 is, this is true uh, uh, very broadly. Uh, uh, in the United States, uh, in in not at the federal level, but at the at on the state level, uh, there are often uh, constitutional requirements that states balance the budget. Now, of course, what the definition of balancing the budget is not always so clear, and, and, and that's, that's a point that I want to come to. The, uh, even, even when you're required by law to balance the budget, uh, there are, um, there is some flexibility in the accounting. Uh, so that, that a strict limit is almost impossible to enforce. Um, and in particular, what governments do, this is, this is universally true, I would say, is to uh, hide some of their spending, or at least partially conceal some of their spending by not putting it on the official balance sheet. So a very striking example of off-balance sheet spending in the United States was the spending on the Iraq War, which was not, not in the budget at all. Uh, and uh, since it ended up 
costing something like a trillion dollars in the uh, in the first uh, five years uh, was was a, a fairly major omission from the from the budget. So, but even in the yes, at the federal level, there is a limit on debt, which is which can only be overcome by decision of Congress. That's right. Uh, at, at, at any given point, uh, there there is a uh, there there is a uh, limit on spending. The problem is that the government can can change that limit at will. So so. In practice, it's not terribly effective. So, uh, so, so, how do we get it? Uh, how do we model this idea? Um, let me suppose that if there's spending Y L, or, or if Y, the Y L is the is the. Uh, actual cost of the pork barrel spending that the government is doing, uh, in fact, uh, only some fraction Y L hat is actually on the balance sheet. And the government has control over uh, how much is on the balance sheet. Uh, that is, that the government has control over L hat. But the problem with choosing L hat, the amount that actually appears on the balance sheet, uh, the, the, the problem with choosing L hat below L is that doing off balance sheet spending is inefficient. Uh, and we'll suppose that there is a uh, a deadweight loss associated with choosing L hat less than L. Uh, it's this function D1 of the difference between the actual spending and, uh, and the uh, spending that appears on the books. So this is just getting the idea that, that I already said, that, that, that if, you, if you don't put it on the books, you, you have to do some creative accounting, and that itself it is typically highly inefficient. Um, so that's one change I want to make to the model uh, in order to get at um, spending limits, the effect of spending limits. Um, another change is that, that's, that so far, the spending that the public uh, is enjoying is, from a social standpoint, wasteful. We've only, so far, we've only looked at uh, pork barrel spending, which the interest groups in question enjoy, but in, from the point of view of society as a whole, it is... Uh, is inefficient. Uh, so, uh, if 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 we could set uh, an optimal spending limit for the model as it stands, it would be zero. We wouldn't want to have any spending at all. Now, of course, in practice, uh, governments, most governments, uh, do some socially useful spending, too, and, and I want to allow for that. Uh, we'll suppose that they can spend money on public goods. Of course, they have a choice between work barrel spending and uh, beneficial public spending. Uh, I'll suppose that uh, from, the, from the social perspective, the optimal level of public spending would be G naught, but once again, uh, the government has the, the choice of deviating from the optimum uh, at a cost. Uh, the, uh, 
the uh, government can, can spend less than GNOX, in which case the, the total benefit to the, to the public is, the, is W, which is, the, uh, which is what it would derive if the government spent the GNOX, minus the, the loss, the deadweight loss, from not spending G0, which is D of G0 minus G. So in this reformulated model, the official maximizes this more complicated e expression, but it Conceptually, it's pretty simple. It, it, it just the uh, uh, the benefits that the official derives from spending on the different interest groups. That, that is the benefit from pork barrel spending. Uh, <coughs> Uh, minus the cost of that spending, uh, uh, and in this case, the official, of course, cares about the the true cost because the true cost is what the public will actually end up incurring. Uh, plus the. Um, uh, benefit from the public good, plus the probability of getting reelected times the benefit of getting reelected, subject to, and now there's a budget constraint, which is that the spending on pub public good plus the pork barrel spending, which is on the books, should be less than the, spend than the spending on the G. So very similar to before, except that we've made two changes. There's now beneficial to public spending G, and there's uh, off-balance sheet spending L hat. Uh, and we can, once again, maximize, uh, go through the maximization exercise and derive first order conditions, which are quite revealing. Uh, there are two of them. Uh, one it uh, tells us something about uh, how L hat and G should be chosen, and the second tells us something about how Y I should be chosen. And uh, the lessons that we learn from the from first order conditions one and two can be summarized in in proposition three. So. Uh, as I said, we're interested in, in the effect of imposing a spending limit on the government. How, how does that affect spending? Uh, let's imagine that, uh, that G, the spending cap, is reduced a bit. What will happen? Well, uh, it, it's going to re reduce pork barrel spending. Uh, and the way to see that is that if we increase, if we decrease G, the uh, the Lagrange multiplier for this constraint, which I'll we'll call mu, will increase as as you tighten the constraint. The Lagrange multiplier for that constraint will increase. So. Uh, Reducing G raises mu, and then if we look at the right-hand side of condition two, uh, the inequality of condition two, uh, the, the right-hand side of this inequality is increasing. That means that the inequality is harder to satisfy, and that means that we are less likely to want to have spending on interest group I. So uh, a stricter 
spending cap decreases uh, pork barrel spending, uh, but it also, unfortunately, decreases public goods spending. Um, and we can see that from uh, condition one. As, as mu goes up, the right-hand side of this equation increases, and therefore, the left-hand side must increase as well. Uh, that means that the derivative of the deadweight loss must be increasing. But the derivative of the deadweight loss increases as G moves away from optimal spending. So, uh, so G must be lower as a result of, uh, of mu increasing. And the, the, the third uh, effect is that we also have more, as we tighten the spending cap, we have more off-balance sheet spending. And this, I'm afraid, is, uh, this is the most interesting part of this result, but it's also the, the, the most distressing in a way. It says that, uh, yes, you can stop pork barrel spending. You will reduce pork barrel spending if you if you lower the spending cap, but you're 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 going to pay for that. Uh, you're going to pay for it not only by uh, less public goods, but you're going to pay for it by more off balance spending, which itself is very inefficient. So it, it it's by no means clear that you're going to want to impose uh, the, these tighter spending caps, even if there's a lot of Pork barrel spending going on. Now, um, there's another lesson that we can learn from first order conditions. Uh, which is that as we increase accountability, uh, we are actually going to want to increase spending caps. Now, uh, the, the reason why this is important is that uh, typically in governments where there are both elected officials and unelected officials, it's the elected officials who typically have the higher budgets. And this result uh, gives possible explanation for that result, which is that um, as we make an official more accountable, unfortunately, that's going to lead to greater pork barrel spending. That's, that's unavoidable. That, that, that's a, a, an unavoidable cost of having accountability. And the way that we deal with that uh, is to uh, <laughs> give, give the elected official a higher spending cap. Yes, we will have more pork, but uh, we'll have more beneficial spending as well. So as R rises, as accountability rises, the right-hand side of this inequality um, goes up. Therefore, we have uh, Sorry, the left-hand side of this inequality goes up. Therefore, we'll have more pork barrel spending. Therefore, we have to raise the spending cap uh, in order to get more um, more beneficial public spending. Rick, uh, some of this uh, optimal spending cap can go into small, in small g in public good. Exactly. That, that, that's why that's why we want to do it. Exactly. Uh, but whether it will increase to a greater extent than the pork barrel will depend on parameters. Or it will. But th but this is but 
this is a general result. Sure. That is, uh, uh, regardless of the mix between pork barrel spending and beneficial public spending, as the official becomes more accountable, we do want to raise the spending cap uh, in order to, to get more, whatever happens, a lower proportion of the budget is being spent on beneficial spending. So since a lower proportion is being spent, we have to raise the total amount of spending to get the G up. Okay, um, now I thought I was going to get through this quickly, but, I, but it appears I, I'm not moving as, as quickly as I, as I thought. We're supposed to stop at 6 o'clock, is that right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, then let me, let, let me, since I said I wanted to allow for questions on previous lectures, let me quickly go through what happens when the uh, official spending propensity is not known. So everything I've done so far assumes that the, uh, that the officials, uh, that everyone knows that the official would like to spend X, uh, and so nothing can be inferred from the, about uh, what the official is going to do in the second period from the amount of spending that the official does in the first period. But if the spending propensity is not known, then, then things get more interesting. Uh, let's assume that the uh, official could be of two types, a, uh, a low spender with probability rho and a high spender probability 1 minus rho. Uh, of course, in each case, the but the high spender will have uh, weights that she attaches to the uh, different interest groups. The low spender will have weights that, uh, that she attaches to the different interest groups. Of course, those weights may not be the same. They won't be the same because the high spender wants to do more spending. Uh, now, let's look at the case where, uh, where total spending is, uh, is not observable. Uh, that means that any inferences pub that the public make about the uh, officials' spending propensity must be on the basis of how much the official spends on them. Uh, and, and now it turns out that there are two possible equilibria. There, there, there's just the generalization of the equilibrium we already had, where uh, both the high and low types of officials spend a half, or half plus epsilon, and, and uh, a group votes for the official uh, if if and only if the group is in the half that the official spent on. So that, that's, that's the same. But interestingly, um, we can have another, we, in some cases we can have another equilibrium. And, and that's when the cost of pork barrel spending is sufficiently bigger than the benefit. And, and th this is a, a, a uh, a very interesting kind of equilibrium. What, what will happen is that both types, the high type and the low type, will, uh, will just spend what they want to spend. That is, they will spend their basic spending propensities, high or low, H, XH or XL. And, but now, a group will vote for the incumbents only if she's not a benefit, uh, only if it's not a beneficiary. Uh, now that sounds weird. Why would you why would you vote against the incumbent if the incumbent spent on you? And the reason is that if the, if L is big enough compared with B, uh, um, spending of any kind is a bad sign. It's a sign that the that the official is a big, is a big spender. 
And remember, we're, we're assuming here that, that, that this spending is inefficient. And so even though the, even though the incumbent is spending on you, because L is so much bigger than B, you're worried about her being uh, reelected because of what she's going to do next period. So you vote her out. Um, <coughs> this is what we actually call the, the, the Groucho Marx equilibrium. Because Grou Groucho Marx is famous for saying that he doesn't want that he didn't want to belong to any club, which would include him as a member. Uh, uh, you don't want to be in, a, in an interest group that an incumbent would want to spend on. <laughs> okay, so that that's the that's the case where, uh, where y is unobservable. Uh, what if y is observable? So so now you you can see directly on the total amount of spending that the incumbent is doing in the first period. Uh, and there are um, <coughs> there are three possible cases, depending again on the ratio of benefits to losses uh, from from this public spending. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just show you uh, one of those equilibria, uh, which is the one which corresponds to low benefits. Um, and um, and high costs. In some sense, it's the case that we care about most because it's the case where the spending is the most harmful. Uh, and in this case, we actually get uh, less spending than we would if the incumbents were unaccountable. So I, I said at the out, in Proposition 1 that one uh, cost of accountability is that you get more spending. And that's all, that, can, that can be true, because incumbents will spend money just to get reelected. But there are cases where actually accountability reduces spending, and that's where um, the cost of spending is so high that you are uh, eager to uh, separate yourself from a type which has a propensity to spend high. So, so in this case, the low type will actually spend less than it would be than it would do if it were unaccountable. And the reason why it spends less is that it wants to signal to the electorate that, it, that, it's a low, that it's a low spending type in order to get reelected. So let, let me just sum up. Uh, the problem, one problem with accountability um, is that you, you have more pork barrel spending than you would with unaccountable officials. However, a, a, an important countervailing uh, effect is that uh, accountability gives you a stronger incentive to appear fiscally conservative. Uh, and, and, and this second effect can often, or at least can potentially outweigh the first effect. In fact, to the extent that spending is transparent, to the effect that we can take measures so that Y is observable to the entire electorate, uh, we, the, the signaling effects that uh, fiscal conservatism generates are actually strengthened, as in, as in that last proposition. And with that observation, uh, I will stop. Thank you very much. Um, speaking about offshore spendings and the example of the Iraq war, do officials consider the effectiveness of their spend <coughs> spendings, or is it enough uh, to reach the effect? Or does the probability of re-election depend more on the effectiveness of spendings or on the effect of spending? Thank you. Okay. It, it, in uh, probability of 
getting reelected uh, depends uh, only on the um, pork barrel stuffing that you do. Uh, uh, however, the official is assumed to care about how effective the spending is. Because uh, let, let me go back to the um, actually it's faster to do it this way. Yeah. Um, so here the the official since ultimately the public cares about the effectiveness of the spending, the official is also assumed to care. Now, the official's objectives don't perfectly align with the, with the public. Remember we said yesterday that officials may be non-congruent. That, that's, here that's modeled through the alphas. That, that is, if, if all of the alphas were the same, then the official and the public would be, would, would be the same. But because the official can favor some groups over others, uh, the official may be non-congruent. However, uh, regardless of whether the official is congruent or not, the official always prefers effective spending to ineffective spending. It's, it's just that in her desire to get reelected, that's not the only thing she cares about. Uh, so, so she's willing to do some ineffective spending also. Does, does that uh, answer your question? Yeah. Well, that's uh, see, off, off sheet spending is Which is, is secret. it's well, it it's it may not be secret, but it it doesn't appear in this. Inequality. So, so if you try to impose a spending cap, the government can get around that by doing the offshoot spending too. People may be perfectly aware of it. It's not as though the Iraq war was a secret. Uh, uh, but it didn't appear in any rules which governed federal government, federal government spending. Thank you. Um, in your model, you uh, sum up uh, the utility function of benefits uh, for politician of uh, his spending today and uh, the, the probability of his election of tomorrow. Right. Uh, but in real life, uh, politicians like to forget about his promises uh, like just uh, after the election and, yes. and remember about this uh, before yeah. the Exactly. And uh, usual people uh, do the same. Yeah. Uh, so does uh, the uh, benefit uh, of spending for politician depend on uh, uh, how close date one is to date two? Politician is not making any promises at this model. The, the way that the politician gets the voter to vote for her is not by making a promise. It's by actually spending. So I spend on you today. Uh, so you can see that I'm spending on you today. You're enjoying the benefit today. And, the, and now you might ask, well, given that I've already spent on you, why should I expect you to vote for me? And the reason in this model that you vote for me is, be, is that spending on you today is a signal that I'm more likely to spend on you tomorrow. I'm not promising to spend on you. But uh, by, by my revealed behavior, you can calculate that you know, it's a pretty good bet that I will spend on you tomorrow. And, that, and, and therefore, you vote for me rather than my opponent, because uh, my opponent hasn't spent on me. Uh, so, so that's the argument. Now, you, you, you might, I, I think you, you make a good point that if there's a bigger gap 
between my spending on you and the election, first of all, you are more likely to forget that I spent on you. And second, there may be other signals that you've seen in the meantime which weaken the effect of my spending on you. And so, so uh, indeed, we would expect in a model like this that I would try to do more spending closer to the election. And of course, that's exactly what we observe in practice, that there's this political spending cycle which, which does weight things toward elections. And this kind of model can, can account for that. One of the important assumptions of the model was that uh, politicians are concerned about being uh, elected. Right. But in fact, uh, in many countries, there are limitations on the availability of such elections. So, yeah, that's right. US president can be elected for more than once. That's right. And uh, in fact, uh, we should see in data uh, that uh, politicians uh, spend different on the different terms. Yeah. So, uh, is it? Uh, that, that, yes, yeah, so that it is an empirical regularity. Right? That uh, uh, if, if you look, if you compare uh, politicians who are term limited and are in their uh, last term compared with, with politicians who are not, the, the, the politicians who are not spend more. And in fact, it was exactly that observation that motivated this paper in the first place. We thought that that was an, an interesting regularity, and we wanted to, it, it, to build a, a model which could account for that and for some other stylized facts. Well, two reasons, at least two reasons why a politician might spend on an interest group. One is because the, uh, the politician is trying to appeal to the interest group, and that's what we have in this model. The other reason is that the interest group is trying to appeal to the politician. The, the interest group uh, is saying, uh, I will do something for you. Uh, beyond just voting for you, uh, but, uh, more, more usually what the interest group will do is to raise money for the politician. Um, and that's, of course, that's important. Uh, and we, we left it out of this model not because we uh, wanted to disregard it, but because there are actually quite a number of existing models in, in literature which have exactly that feature. Uh, this, this feature we don't think, at least we're not aware of, uh, in, in previous models. So this, this, is, this is our product differentiation. Uh, the correct model would have both, but I'm not sure that putting both in would tell us anything additional that we didn't already know. Uh, what are some uh, further features of group Y? You, at the beginning of your lecture, mentioned that uh, politicians uh, have to build a coalition of this group. Why is it only one group? The coalition is going to build a, a, uh, a, a continuum of groups, adding up to total weight one half 
plus epsilon. And that is only one dimension. There, with, that, that's right. There's only one dimension that is uh, uh, interest groups in this model differ only in alpha. Uh, by alpha, how much weight the politician puts on them. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a richer model, there can be other things that differentiate interest groups too. Um, uh, and we're supposing that everyone in the same interest group, and everyone in, in interest group I is, is the same. Of course, not all, um, not all, uh, anti-abortion people are the same. And in fact, anti-abortion people are in one, typically the same person can be in several different interest groups. I, I might be an anti-abortionist, but also uh, I might be uh, uh, pro-immigration. Uh, so uh, so th th this is definitely a uh, strongly simplified but, I, but I, I think, nevertheless, it's, it's, it's getting at, um, at something real. Real is at a high standard. And uh, let me invite everybody uh, next year. Uh, the 10th uh, Green Kiss Lecturers will be delivered by Ariel Rubenstein, who's also a uh, long term colleague of uh, three. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Thank Once you. again, thank you.